Good afternoon and welcome to Summit Live. This is episode 29 and it's called Progressive Design for Residential Spaces. It's March 2nd, 2021. My name is David Newmark. I am the president of Summit International Flooring. And to my right, as almost always, is our national sales director, Mark Becker. Hello, Mark, and thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we have a very special guest. Uh, his name is Bill Sook. He owns a company called Sook Design Group. I have had the pleasure of knowing Bill since 1992. So we are now 29 years friends. Yes, I'm trying not to joke around too much because we do normally kid around with each other quite a bit. Uh, Bill uh, has done some very interesting projects uh, in his lifetime. He's worked for numerous large corporations, one of which I met him at uh, years ago, and we will discuss one of those projects that we did together at that time. But Bill is uh, best known now for his high-end residential design. With that, let's welcome in Bill from New York City. Bill, are you there now? I am here, David. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, yes, David, I've, I've known you longer than I've known my wife. So uh, that's probably not a great thing, but uh, now, Dave, you've been a great friend over the years and, and uh, it's been such a pleasure working with you all these years. And I just, uh, uh, although I am wondering what took you so long to bring me on the show? Well, you know, uh, the truth of the matter is we've had much more interesting people than you to bring on the first 28 episodes. It reached the point where we hit a lull in the, in the scheduling, and I and, and <laughs> Alan Smith, who's working the board today, he comes to me. He goes, "What are we going to do next week?" I said, "Don't worry, I have a standby." And uh, <laughs> I was going to tell him one of these practices right before he was on. I, you know, I, I couldn't wait past the first two minutes of the show to start on you. I love Bill. He's been a friend of mine. He's a loyal, loyal friend and a, and a good man uh, for, since 1992 when I met him. Uh, but we're going to turn this show over right now to Mark and let Mark ask you a couple questions about your business and we'll get going. Sure. First thing, if you want to tell the audience anything about yourself and where you get your design points, whether it comes from people from art or nature, uh, we'd like to learn a little bit about you. And then I have a couple of questions about actual uh, interior residential designs. Sure. Uh, and Mark, I couldn't really hear you that well, but so maybe you can turn up your microphone a little bit. But um, a little bit about my company. Uh, as David mentioned, I, 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 I was born and raised in, uh, in Michigan. And, uh, uh, and I thank Dave over there, but he's, he's uh, showcasing that University of Michigan helmet over there. That's for me, because uh, I went to the University of Michigan and I'm a proud Wolverine, uh, ranked number two in the country for basketball. Thank you very much. We won't talk about football at the moment. Uh, but uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, but as soon as I was born and raised in Michigan, so as soon as I was able to, uh, as soon as I finished college, I said, I've got to get the hell out of Michigan. So the, I came out to New York. I said, if it's, it's go, it's go bigger, go home or go back home to Michigan. But I uh, came to, to uh, New York in 1989, uh, worked for some large firms and, uh, uh, but very quickly felt that, I, I felt that entrepreneurial spirit and, and uh, you know, wanted, felt that draw like David uh, has over the years to start my own company. And um, much to David's chagrin, because, you know, when I was working for these large companies, I was, I was doing a lot more corporate, uh, corporate work and specifying corporate all the time. I started my own firm and, and of course, like many other small architecture firms, a big part of their work is always going to be in residential design. Um, so that's what we started doing. And uh, I'm actually in my 25th year. So this this September will be my 25th anniversary uh, of Soap Design Group, um, which is we're very proud of that. And you know we've we've had some amazing uh, projects and clients and uh, uh, experiences over all those years. And uh, we, we just still love doing what we do every day and, and really enjoy doing residential design. 
Okay. <laughs> we work together so You long. can see how well we practice this. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and yes, Mark and I have worked together for so long. We both have, have a number of questions. i to ask you something. Working, I mean, when you and I worked together going back into 1992, we were, I remember the very first project, I'm not going to name it for various reasons, but it was about a 50 or 60,000 square foot project that we worked on together in, uh, the project was on Long Island, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah if that's the same project that you're thinking of. And it was very different because we the, the dynamics of working with a large firm and on a large project, you know, is very different than working hand in hand, uh, you know, every, every day with a with a husband and wife on a on an apartment or a townhouse or something like that. So uh, how did you adjust? I mean, what made you switch from commercial to residential? That's the first question. Uh, well, the first, the first question and the reason it, it, it's uh, purely by necessity. <laughs> uh, you know, when you're coming from a large firm uh, with large firm backup and principals that have been in the business for, you know, decades and have uh, those relationships with facility managers and uh, so forth, I didn't really have that. Uh, so, I mean, I had some, but not at that kind of level. So by necessity, I mean, I, I hung my shingle. I'm like, oh, I need to make some money here uh, and I need to get whatever clients I could. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it just, I'm wondering, most yeah. people don't leave a safe a person you'll call back. Most people don't leave a safe, uh, a safe job, uh, a paycheck, unless they have something lined up ready to go, at least to get them started. Did yeah. you have someone knocking at your door and saying get started i got you know i got you covered for this first project or you just said that's it i'm done i'm starting on my own no i i, I did have one project and it was my first project that i started my firm with was actually not a high-end residential job it was uh designing a hair salon in staten island for a guy named Vinny. <laughs> okay and uh but uh and somehow I stumbled on this project and it, and it was quite the experience. Uh, it, it, it's, it's total baptism by submersion here. Uh, but I learned a lot and he, he really uh, took a chance on me. Uh, he also got me for a really cheap price, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, so to some extent, you know, he got what he paid for, but, but he did take a chance on me and, and uh, that, that really helps to, to launch, to launch my firm. Well, that, that that's great, and of course, you know, I think Vinny is Mark's hairdresser as well. Yeah, he did a lousy job, though. <laughs> anyway, so Bill, you've got the tenure to have seen designs change over the years, and one of the things I'm curious about: Are you seeing similar designs come back in different scale from 20 to 25 years ago? Well, I'll tell you one thing that that never that never changes, uh, certainly in residential design. It's traditional. Um, you know, there, I, I'm not a, you know, when I first came out of college, I, I was really much like many architects coming out of school, staunch modernists. You know, I, I wanna build skyscrapers. I wanna, you know, uh, design spaces that are, that are concrete and glass and steel and so forth. Um, but um, and, you know, this is a, for instance, this loft project is a very, very modern type of approach to a project. But one thing that has not changed over the years is uh, there are still a lot of clients that like traditional design, uh, crown molding, uh, traditional spaces. Um, uh, like, for instance, this townhouse, uh, this is a master bathroom that we did uh, for a townhouse on 22nd Street in Chelsea. That type of approach, uh, design approach, has not really changed a lot. Uh, and as far as our firm is considered, you know, the way we approach it is just that even though I wasn't a traditionalist by any means, at the same time, it's a client's house. It's not my house, it's a client's house. If they're paying me to design something for them, I want them to have what they want. And even though I didn't know too much about traditional design at first, we learned a lot about it just because I wanted to put forward something that was uh, authentic and true. Yeah, I had been thinking more about scale because 
I worked for a company a long time ago that when it was time to create new designs, we went to the library, we looked at, let's say we looked at Paisley's from 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and we looked at similar Paisley's and just made them a much smaller scale and it became more current. So I, I was curious about that. I, I understand your answer completely, um, which leads me to wonder when you're in these residential spaces, is technology becoming important in the, um, look, we're looking at a bathroom now, is technology becoming important on the residential side or are, do people care if faucets turn on and off without them touching it? Is that is that anything on the residential side to, to even think about? Or is that more? Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I think it's very much uh, technology has driven a lot uh, over the years, mostly, but in home, what we call home automation and home control. Um, so uh, we haven't really gotten to the point of, uh, of uh, having technology turn faucets on or off. But um, certainly lighting and audio and video and uh, controlling your um, HVAC and uh, so, you know, heating and cooling um, to smart appliances, uh, you know, they have all come a long, long way as far as being able to you know, be controlled. However, I would say that one big um, uh, advance in technology or change or trend has just been there used to be a time in, in the early 2000s, uh, so forth, you know, you heard of systems like Crestron or Savant, uh, where people were spending could some tens of thousands, up to hundreds of thousands of dollars in home control, uh, where you have this huge rack inside of your house and all lit up and you have Crestron controls everywhere. Um, you know, by because of the age of the iPhone and everything being more app-based, uh, People don't feel like we still wire up homes to, uh, you know, for um, technology. Uh, so for technology, but we're not seeing a ton of. Um, a lot of people just want to go to their app and just control the lights from the Lutron yeah. app. Control their shades. Yeah. They don't feel like they have to spend a ton, a ton and ton of money these days. Yeah, I I, I know for a fact that I'm one of these people that could control certain things with my app and I wouldn't want to deal with all these other things. And it just reminded me of how much I actually hated my mm -hmm. old home had this sink that you just have to like touch it. And it would, you know, it, it would put on the water. Problem was it had battery, battery control. And there were like eight little batteries in this thing below the sink. And to get to the batteries was brutal. I had a yeah. lay down on the, on the bottom and stick my head in there like a plumber and reach to this thing it was terrible. So I've never been a fan of that ever since that. Do you even know what I'm talking about, Bill? Do you know, do you know these little battery packs? Yes, I do. I, I, the, the view I'm trying to get out of my head is you crawling underneath your sink to do that. Yeah, but you did not. This was a completely different pose, and I promise you my shirt was tucked all the way in. i got to wash my eyes out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, love you, I know that's a scary thought anyway so Bill, listen um talk to us a little bit about that west 22nd street townhouse mark uh, alan has some pictures up and he will again but i know you won uh, a very nice award for that design and it's beautiful it looks just like my home just saying right hey. someday dave someday yeah. Yeah, some yeah. more carpet um th this was a unique uh project and and it's not the biggest project that we've done uh, but it was it was certainly one of the most challenging and and but also one of the most um, uh, rewarding. This townhouse is only 16 feet wide, uh, so if you think about it, it's just two sheets of plywood uh, lengthwise laid you know laid down next to each other. That's that's how wide this house is. Um, but my clients bought this house and we we put an extension to the rear and we put a penthouse on top. The, uh, it was unique because it was at the end of a row, uh, and so that that whole western facade faced a uh, a playground park, and um, we were able to get approved uh, window openings on that west facade, just right like here, which actually made a huge difference uh, to to the feeling of the inside space. Those smaller windows along the center line uh, were actually centered on the staircase that winds up. So it's just a, a wonderful uh, 
house and we were able to pack in a lot of uh it doesn't feel like a 16 foot wide house um yeah. and that's that's from the use of light and the light color that you use yes and and you know that master bathroom that you saw earlier that was from that house um and the kitchen uh we're very proud to say was um we entered the kitchen design one of the largest most recognized uh kitchen design competitions that's sponsored by sub-zero wolf and um we submitted this and we got a regional prize and then it got sent up to the to the uh to the global competition and we ended up winning a global first prize uh, for traditional kitchen design. Um, so this was something we we're very proud about. And, you know, we built this house, uh, the house was completed about five years ago and it still gets a lot of press and a lot of uh, recognition. Um, how many stories on top of that, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry, how many stories is that? Because this picture that we have up right now, mm -hmm. looks like it just goes on and on. Well, it, to the penthouse, there's five stories above grade. So it's like a four-story four townhouse, and then the, we added a, a penthouse on top. But that's what we call, like, we call that an oculus stair because it just, you can see all the way to the top. But, I, you know, I think on top of all the, you know, great design accolades and, and, and how much we like it from a from aesthetic standpoint, we also – feel very strongly about trying to deliver value to our clients because we still realize that it's, this is still a real estate uh, investment and that we want to, we want to install kind of a timeless design that, you know, if you got to sell this thing that you can exit and still make money on it. And actually these clients uh, did very well. They, they almost took a, a bet from a broker friend of theirs who said I could sell this house for sixteen million dollars, uh, and six weeks later he did, um, and you know it was quite a healthy profit margin uh, based on the acquisition and construction costs. I won't say how much, but um, it was very healthy, and uh, it, it broke a record. How long was he there? You planned how long did they live there? I, I thought the way I just understood that is you built that for them and then a short while afterwards they flipped it. Yep. How, how long did they live there? Uh, three months. Wow. Well, I don't know what his profit is, but I hope you had a, a piece of that. I Maybe wish I did. Something. But I wish there, I did. I, I did. No, there, there was something else I was curious about. When we work on the commercial side of the world, mm -hmm. um, What's become very important or more important, I guess, is the use of recycled materials. And I'm just curious, when you're working on the residential side, are you introducing recycled materials or do your clients even care to ask about recycled material? Well, it depends on the client, but we try as much as possible to do that. Uh, and and we are usually introducing more green concepts, not, not necessarily with the materials, but in the method of construction. So um, extremely high efficiency, uh, air conditioning and heating systems, insulation, um, uh, appliances, lighting, LED lighting, control, so forth. We're trying to introduce in the infrastructure better ways to make their homes energy efficient. The actual use of materials, not as much, although uh, a lot of times, um, like these, this old home, for instance, all of those wood joists that came out of this house uh, were were recycled for other for other areas. Uh, in other houses, we've used um, we've taken those wood joists, planed them, use them use them for shelving uh, or for cabinetry or for millwork and stuff like that. Um, so we found some ways to to adaptively reuse uh, some of these products that were already in the house. Now, when you're working with a space that's that narrow and you're working with a lot of windows, is sound dampening becoming a big part of your work as well? Uh, it always it always is and has been. Uh, and by sound dampening, the basic way to do it is just to invest a little bit more into the windows uh, and into their acoustic performance. It, this is the moment during Summit Live where the sales director gets into shameless self-promotion. Mm -hmm. We're working with Grenor Cork now. 
The cork is recycled from the waste when they make bottles, uh, wine stoppers. Yep. Very sound dampening, very green, renewable, reusable, and digitally printed these days or painted. So it's not just the look of cork. So I'm yep. off the quote box, but had to mention at least one of our products throwing every episode. And, and you need to know that you're a day behind me because I sent to Bill's office uh, yesterday for today delivery uh, the Grenort uh, cork. That looks like wood because I'm going to try to convince Bill and Claudia in his office to start using it. Well, your clients will be happy for Nothing sure. like putting you on the spot like that, though, huh? It's funny. We have been working together a long time. We think alike. So, Bill, something else. Before we get too close to the end of the show, I did want to ask you, we've been learning the last couple of weeks, and we've been hearing from different designers the word form and the word shape. And you talked about that a little bit on your website. So I wanted to get your take on how you use form and shape into your projects. Form and shape. You know, we have we have a lot of uh, younger designers, more more people starting their careers that are watching our show. So perhaps they can learn something from you. Well, let's see. I have form and shape. I, I think it's always just going to be an exploration, uh, and then you know it's it's always going to also be an exploration and and what seems to what the clients seem to fancy. Uh, for instance. Here's a, a building that we're designing. Uh, it's, I haven't even shown this to my client yet, so I can't even disclose the address. But um, so form and shape, you know, we're looking at two different, um, two different um, variations of the same uh, building. And these are all different um, uh, different approaches, but it's based on the same zoning, right? Because it, the zoning dictates the overall envelope of the building. But you can see from this um, from this building, you know, we're, we're using a much more rigid and but chamfered uh, ele vertical elements. But we also really like this scheme, which is kind of different for us. Uh, more archways, more rounded, uh, and it's. One of my designers, Andrea, uh, did a lot of work on this, and, and I thought this was a fantastic approach to the facade of this building. So, so you've got two options there. Did your client, uh, I guess your client didn't tell you they had a specific idea, so you're bringing them various ideas to choose from and get a better feel for what they want? Exactly. Sometimes we have to just, sometimes our clients don't necessarily know what they want, uh, and, and we just have to bring a couple different approaches just so we can gauge their reaction. Um, and, and you know, what's what's great about something like this is that these models were all 3D printed. Um, so uh, we were able to, we generated this uh, in on our computer, but um, printed them out three-dimensionally. So we were able to really bring these prototypes to life, if you will, because not, nothing's going to be seeing a physical model to really get an understanding of I'm um, sorry, but how long does it take to print something that size? Uh, this so this is about eight inches tall. This this model took about um, overnight to print. So about eight. You know, very quick. Uh, did did you do that in house? The three D printing. Yes. Yep. That's fantastic. That's yeah, a, that's a whole a, new element. It, it's a whole new world that that we're not terribly familiar with right now. But, but well, I I think you know it just goes to the amazing amount of visualization tools that are out there and available for architects. Uh, I mean that three D printer is not a cheap investment, but you know what I what I tell clients what I tell uh, all the time is that it's cheaper to figure it out on paper or in this case plastic. Um, than then seeing, then trying to figure out in the field when, when it's delaying the process or, or you know, then it's an expensive change order, right? So we're trying to, we're trying to help our clients visualize the project as much as possible before they're actually going to build it. And I think that's, it's just gonna help, it helps us to avoid mistakes in the in, Yeah, most, know. most of the brands that we work with have configurators on the websites so that you can try different, different, uh, designs and turn tiles different directions mm -hmm. to see how mm -hmm. things change the technology is really 
come a long way. I remember years ago to make a custom rug with one color in the center and one color border, we would mail pictures back and forth to Georgia, to the mills and mail them back and it would take weeks. And then came the fax machine and now you do it by email. It's, it's in three seconds you can design a new rug. Yeah, yeah. Technologies have changed. But Bill, before we, before we end this show, I want to bring you back in time to what I worked on with you, one of the many projects I've worked on with you in the past, because I just think it's interesting. And I think, um, I think who the people that are watching this show would appreciate it. The USS Intrepid is docked on the west side on the Hudson River, somewhere around 40, 40, 40 maybe, Second Street. Um, I worked on this project with you. I had the pleasure of carpeting the hangar deck. And if, if you don't yeah. know what that is, let me just tell you, it's 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 below uh, the, the, the very, I mean, I don't know the proper terminology, but it's in the middle of the ship. It's very large. It's steel. There's a tremendous amount of rivet, rivets, and we had to get that done. And I, I was very impressed by the work that you did to alter a battleship, uh, not just with interior finishes, but as you can see with this picture, staircase and, and, and uh this deck outside. So tell us just a little bit, if you would, about the project. Well, we, we were honored to uh, have been, we, we were the architects uh, for the Intrepid for probably about a seven year period. And, and we oversaw about $20 million worth of capital projects over those years, uh, including this education center, which is on the back end of the ship the visitor center, the, the theater on there, some and and even things as mundane as a heater boiler, uh, uh, a boiler chiller plant on the on the pier. Uh, uh, we aided in the flight deck restoration. Um, it, it's an incredible uh, place, and we were we were so happy to have been a part of it. There was a time when uh, the flight deck was just. Uh, was not watertight. It was leaking like crazy all the time. And uh, the Intrepid held events uh, on board the ship uh, to raise money. Uh, they've had guests uh, of honor, uh, such as Ronald Reagan, uh, Colin Powell, Margaret Thatcher, Itzhak Rabin, George Bush, so forth and so on, Bill Clinton. Um, and, you know, this flight deck just leaked water all the time. <laughs> And, and the, the, the hangar deck that Dave is talking about was made of steel and uh, it was slippery. It uh, uh, would get rusted out and so forth. So, and very loud when you have a ton of kids in there. So um, we needed the, the museum at the time wanted to carpet the entire hangar deck. Uh, and the only guy I thought of was Dave Newmark uh, to do this project because um, I knew he would be the only sucker. That well, we learned about his acumen in plumbing already. <laughs> under the sink. Okay, yeah. He knows that. He's a patriot. He's a patriot. And, uh, you know, I, and, and he just really came through. He, he really, they, he had the, the technical knowledge to try and deal with a very difficult substrate. You can't just like put plywood on the steel deck. You know, you just, there were a lot of things that you just really had to work around. And we were yeah. on a very tight schedule and a very tight budget. And Dave really pulled through. It was great. Uh, great and I thank you. Thank you very much for those words, Bill. And quite honestly, it was a pleasure working with you on that, uh, as always, and on that project. And one of the nice perks I had is I was able to go to the Intrepid anytime I wanted for free with my kids. And I did yeah. take advantage of that. Uh, both Jeffrey and Matthew uh, had been to the Intrepid. I would venture to say, four or five times a piece with me. Nice. For no reason at all, just, just something to do. Well, if, if people visit New York, they should definitely check it out. I've Absolutely. taken my son when he was younger. It, it's a really cool thing to see. All right, so Bill, listen, I can sit and chat with you all day, every day. I have the best times with you. I love you, I love you to tears. I love you forever. Um, uh, you're, you're a good man. You're a great architect, a great friend. I thank you for your time. Um, I'll be talking to you soon, and I want you to go blue forever go blue thanks okay. Dave. bill thanks Thank so, you. so that was bill sook uh from sook design group uh if you if you couldn't tell um i've been friends with bill for a long long time he's a great man uh great person great architect next week we have uh Ritamar brar from 
R. Terrier in LA. She will be on next week. Uh, she's going to talk about reinvention of interior space. I will not be hosting next week. It'll be uh, Mark Becker and uh, Alan Smith uh, together uh, for next week's show. Um, if you should have any questions that you'd like answered or like us to discuss any particular topics, please feel free to email us at info at summit-flooring.com or if you'd like to speak with me or Mark, 1-800-496-3566. That's our toll-free number. You can call us. We will listen. We may not listen to what you have to say, but we'll, we'll, we'll pretend to listen. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us for this uh, March 2nd edition of Summit Live. We'll look for you next week. Thank you.